Well, you're all very welcome back to the last session of the Good Summit this afternoon. And that was certainly a very uh, rousing um, video to watch before we go into a dis uh, our discussion, our final discussion of the day. I don't think I've ever uh, been asked to chair a panel following a surfing video before, but I like it, I have to say. And uh, it's, certainly, uh, it's, it's certainly different. And I suppose it reminds us all of the importance of uh, outdoor pursuits and living healthy lives, and, uh, and we'll be bearing those common points in mind as we go into talking about gender equality and women's empowerment and global health this afternoon. And I'm delighted to have such a great panel. I'll be chairing, my name's Ivana Bacic, a Labour TD or Member of Parliament here in Dublin Bay South and lecturer in Trinity College, which is hosting us here today. And our panel on gender equality and women's empowerment will be looking at UN Sustainable Development Goal 5 in particular, and we'll be looking broadly at how we can ensure that women's rights are guaranteed and protected, and that we can make progress on women's rights and women's empowerment globally. Um, and we'll bring the same multidisciplinary perspectives that we have done on earlier panels this afternoon. So we've got four great panellists joining us, three in person and one online. Uh, it was uh, Deirdre Carberry, who's over there, who's the World Health Innovation Summit Expert Group Chairperson for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment. And she's also a security strategist and senior gender advisor and a military veteran. She joined the army in 2004 um, and was an infantry officer for 15 years and served overseas with the UN in Lebanon and in the D Democratic Republic of Congo. And she was a member of the international project team for Ireland's first and second national actions plans on women, peace and security. Uh, then we'll have Sharon Morrow, who's here uh, with me. And Sharon is director of the All Island Congenital Heart Disease Network, is a qualified nurse and has held a number of senior positions within the health service, including National Clin Clinical Care Program Manager with the Royal College of Physicians and the HSE. And she's also been Chief Operations Officer at the Adelaide and Meath Hospital and has worked as Chief Executive Officer with Laura Lynn Children's Hospice. And then we'll have Ruth Breslin, who is over 20 years of experience as, in, uh, as a researcher in both NGO and academic settings and is a core member now of the research team at the Sexual Exploitation Research Programme at UCD, or SERP. And I've had the pleasure of working with Ruth on many different issues, but particularly around her work on research and policy development on uh, the interrelated issues of prostitution and trafficking for the purposes of sexual exploitation. And Ruth has done a great deal of work on those issues and on gender-based violence more generally. And uh, finally, we'll be joined by Adrian Seabrook, who is, thank you, Adrian, uh, as if by magic you've appeared on our screens. Uh, and Adrian is an experienced nurse and clinical educator who has worked in intensive care and emergency departments in Canada and is a COVID vaccinator in Limerick and is a core member of Women in Global Health Ireland and co-founder of the Youth Engagement in Health Promotion Journal. And Adrian is standing in. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, I think Nadine Ferris Fran France is unable to join us. So I'm going to start this session, which I'm really looking forward to this discussion, as somebody who's worked for all my political career on uh, women's health issues, on reproductive rights in particular. Uh, I'm really interested in how we can progress, how we can make progress on women's empowerment, on gender equality, through use of the of the Sustainable Development Goals. But how do we make them work in practice, and in particular? as we come through COVID, and I know this has been the theme throughout the day, as we come through this pandemic cautiously, how has COVID impacted on our progress towards greater equality for women? And I'm going to ask Deirdre perhaps to set the scene first and to give us a few, I suppose, a few of your insights based on your own experience as to how COVID has impacted on our move towards greater equality for women. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for that, and it's a, it's a great intro. I suppose, not to oversimplify it, but when we look at COVID and how it's impacted on gender equality, um, it, ne it has negatively impacted. But I caveat that by saying um, it actually has created a unique opportunity that if we can uh, seize those opportunities um, and look at what we're focusing on today, the actions that we can take, we actually might be able to, to turn the tide in relation to the, the negative or downward trends that we're seeing when we look at, at gender equality. Um, so to set the scene more broadly, um, really we're faced with new realities. We're faced with a new way of life, a new way of thinking. We've had to rethink our structures. And I always say war, crisis, 
uh, a pandemic, so this particular microbial disease, they don't discriminate but they exist in societies that do discriminate. So people in social structures um, discriminate. Um, and we need to be aware of that, we need to understand that, um, and we need to build more robust structures. And I know we're going to have some, some great discussions on you know, how we can build uh, robust programs and health systems. Um, I think COVID-19 could, could reverse, could potentially reverse the very limited progress that we've made um, in terms of, of gender equality and women's rights. Um, and I do think we've seen that the pandemic has exacerbated existing inequalities. Uh, very often it's reinforced kind of harmful, potentially damaging stereotypes as well. Um, and to, to kind of give the, the broad overview when we look at what we look at when we see, when we talk about human security. So those things that we, we all need um, to be prosperous, uh, to ensure that sustainable development um, occurs. We've seen compounded economic impacts um, these especially felt uh, by women and girls who've been negatively impacted, um, generally earning less, saving less um, in uh, insecure jobs or potentially living close to poverty. Um, we've seen a lot of early reports. And when we talk about gender equality, is, it is important to mention its impacts on men and women, boys and girls, um, not just have a focus on, on a particular uh, uh, grouping. Um, but we do see that generally um, indirect consequences around health, uh, women have been negatively impacted through the reallocation of resources, um, including, as you've mentioned, sexual and reproductive health uh, resources as well. Um, we saw that unpaid care work has increased um, with children out of school, uh, caring for the sick, the elderly, um, because of how our, our societies in general um, are, are kind of made the women predominantly do the main uh, of the care work. Um, and uh, we do as well see overwhelmed health services. So these interconnected factors, we can't just look at health or we can't just look at gender equality in isolation. We do have to see the interconnected factors of, of economic security, health security, education, um, and how our societies are structured. Um, so I guess, yeah, that, that kind of sets the scene um, in terms of, of what we're seeing more broadly. Um, and I know we're going to delve a little bit deeper into, we've seen an increase in sexual gender-based violence. We've seen an increase in intimate partner violence. Um, and it would be great, and I know Ruth is going to unpack some of that as well. Um, so yeah, in a word, negatively uh, impacted certainly by COVID, but has created a unique opportunity. And that's what I hope we'll be able to look at some action points today and discuss them. Thanks very much, Deirdre. And I think, uh, I think we're all very aware of that, that reinforcement of, ne of gender stereotypes of exist pre-existing inequalities. And that we've seen that with, throughout the pandemic, the exacerbation of, uh, of inequalities. And certainly for, on gender, where I think we're all very conscious of the, this very disproportionate impact upon women and upon women's career progression, uh, among other things and uh, anyone who's been engaged in homeschooling will know that's a euphemism and it really has impeded women's career progress in so many ways and uh, uh, and women in poverty in particular have been really uh, severely impacted so Sharon what are what about the Irish healthcare system um from Deirdre set a, the scene more uh, globally but how can we say we have coped here and how has the Irish healthcare system worked to help us move towards greater equality or or not um, well I, I suppose I can I can answer that question in two ways, BC and post, uh, before COVID and after COVID. Um, before COVID, I suppose in the healthcare system, uh, and, and I probably break it into three parts. One is for those that are working within the healthcare system, like myself, those that are users and engage with the healthcare system, so those that we work with and for, um, and those that are external to the healthcare system that might be uh, impacted as well. So for those that are within the workforce within the healthcare system, it's predominantly female, so it's a 76% of frontline workers, whether that's doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, health and social care professionals and so on are, are female. Um, and we also know that about 60% globally of the healthcare workforce is made up of nurses. Uh, and of those nurses, 90% uh, are female. Um, and it's a very similar statistic for here as well. Um, so when you look back at previous studies and previous reports in relation to empowerment and gender equality, you see it 
a different responses coming back from the disciplines. So the nurses will speak about feeling disempowered, um, whereas the medical staff will very much speak about gender inequality. So you have different approaches uh, and different feedback coming from different disciplines. Um, the nurses, particularly in relation to any studies that have been done there, will speak about um, professional respect being absent, uh, loss of control, um, not having power, um, and that this is impacted in a way or led by their leaders, their managers, um, and also by their educational status as well. Um, and a lot of for work, I suppose, that has been done, particularly within uh, nursing since, the, since those reports, have focused very much on leadership and management studies, um, both within the HSE and the Department of Health, and also with education. So we now have a nursing uh, a cohort or nursing staff that have gone from graduate to advanced nurse practitioners in order to develop that. The medical side is a bit more tricky. Um, so uh, the Irish Medical Organization did a, a position paper in 2017 on women in medicine. Um, and it's worth a read. Um, the, the statistics in that are not, uh, do not throw medicine into, into any shining light. Uh, so we're looking at, for non-consultant hospital doctors, about 20% have said they have experienced gender-based bullying. Um, about 26% have experienced gender-based harassment, and 18% have experienced sexual harassment of some kind. Uh, and the majority of respondents were female. And the interesting part is that for those that have said they've experienced sexual harassment or bullying, it's from their colleagues. Um, or their employer or other managers. Um, and that's the bit that you kind of go, really, is that still, is that still what we're up against? Um, there are things that have been done to try and improve that. Um, and the other glaringly obvious deficit within uh, medical training that comes out in that report is, uh, is motherhood is the, the ability for female medics to have a family and still progress with their career. So in, in this country, about 7% of our surgeons are female. Um, and that's the, the main reason that most will give is because they have to take time out to have children. Um, so there are, there are loads of things um, in relation to gender equality and empowerment that we have done, but there's more to do. Um, and COVID, back to what uh, you were saying, is has not helped. It's probably set things back. So you have the majority of frontline workers who are women, um, who are trying to work extremely hard on the front line, deal with COVID, work extra shifts because colleagues have either been told to self-isolate or have COVID, um, and at the same time go home. And we know that the lion's share of homework uh, is, is, is done by the, the female in the house, the woman in the house. So they are going home to homeschool, uh, to cook, clean, um, after working busy shifts. So I would say that in relation particularly to the frontline workforce, the fallout from COVID we haven't seen yet. Um, and that emotional, uh, that physical, um, or just exhaustion that many staff have, I think we'll, we'll see that. Like we're into another surge now for the winter. Um, it could be another year before we start to see really the impact of that. So that's, that's within the service with our patients. You know, we're, we're always talking about trying to empower patients, particularly those with chronic diseases, that they can look after their own or contribute to their own disease management. And then with, I suppose, without externally, I was trying to look back and see how many, um, how many ministers for health had been female. <laughs> I found two. Um, so I had Mary O'Rourke and uh, Mary Harney. And I think Mary Cotton did it for a little while. She did, she double jobbed. Um, but that was it. Of 32 governments, we had two ministers for health. And I was also trying to look back and see secretary generals, how many of those have been female. I've gone back as far as Michael Kelly. I can't get any further back. I don't think there have been any. Um, so from a political perspective, certainly there's room for more, um, more women's voices in there. Um, and that's, I suppose I'll stop there. I'll stop there. That's for sure about the women's voices. And it's <laughs> yeah. something that so many of us have been talking about throughout the pandemic, how few women's voices were at the top table of decision makers from the health service, or so it certainly, so it certainly appeared. And in politics, as you've said, Sharon, we're really no, absolutely no better. Still only 20 23% of TDs in the, uh, in the doll are women. I was the uh, 37th woman elected out of 160, and it's only when you're sitting in the chamber and looking around, you see just how male 
the uh, setting is. Uh, some years ago, a bit like the IMO report you uh, referenced, I did a report for, on women in politics and we identified in 2009 five C's that hold women back. And that's now entered the literature, this concept of the five C's, that what impedes women uh, progressing in their careers relative to their male colleagues are the lack of cash, an old boy's culture, lack of access to childcare, a lack of confidence, those are four C's that are common that keep women on a sticky floor, not even a approaching a glass ceiling, but stuck to a sticky floor. And then in politics, you have a fifth C of candidate selection procedures in political parties that were holding women back. We've tried to address that through a gender quota, but it's as yet of limited success because we need to see other measures brought in too, and that holds true in so many different sectors. Uh, so I could talk about that all day, but I want to uh, go to you, Ruth, because from your work and your experience on gender based violence. Uh, I think, again, we've seen a, just an impact there with COVID, and uh, I'd love to hear more from you about that and what we can do to address that, just the impact COVID has had on rates of violence in the home in particular, and how women in particular have been impacted. I think it's so interesting from the panel here that we've already picked up, all of us, on the issue of gender-based violence. You were talking about the sexual harassment and bullying in the workplace. You were talking about it, Deirdre, you know, at a global level. And I think that that absolutely is true. I mean, if we look at the situation across the globe, uh, the World Health Organization says that one in three women will experience domestic and sexual violence in their lifetimes. Like, that is a very, you know, very stark figure. That's a, a lot of women across the globe when you think about it. And and I suppose we are, it's absolutely true that that has been further exacerbated through the pandemic and has led the UN to even talk about it as being a kind of shadow pandemic that was happening underneath the, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic. So, I, you know, it's a cliche and it's been said at the UN and it's been said so many times in so many different contexts about the fact that, you know, gender-based violence is both a cause and a, con a consequence of gender inequality. But, you know, I suppose we need to unpack what that really means. So, you know, if you're experiencing that kind of violence in your life, of course it sets you back, of course it erodes you, of course it erodes your confidence, of course it affects your health. And I mean, it, you know, this is often framed as a public health issue because it's so prevalent and has such an impact on women's health in terms of their physical health, their mental health, their sexual and reproductive health. So, you know, I think framing it in that way is important when we think about it from a kind of health perspective. But I mean, you know, it's, it's holding us back in many ways. I think if we have those experiences of violence or even living with the fear of it potentially happening to you, even if it isn't, actually happened to you right now, the fear is always there. I think we feel it, we sense it as women and girls. So it's holding us back from perhaps taking our rightful place at many tables in politics, in industry, in the professions, in academia. And then, you know, we, so we're talking about it as a cause of gender inequality, but also a consequence. So if you, you are in a relationship with somebody who does not believe in gender equality, who does see women and girls as somehow lesser, that can lead to a situation where perhaps it's easier to harm that person, it's easier to control and bully that person because you perhaps don't see them as equal to you, as human as you in a way. So I think, you know, we come back to that all the time that we need to remind ourselves that that violence is a huge, huge barrier to achieving a gender equality across the globe. And I think, you know, we've got a lot to do, Ivana, you touched on it, we've got a lot to do, I suppose, in terms of tackling that. Um, but in, I suppose just to reflect quickly on how the pandemic operated, you know, if we saw something like in this situation of domestic violence, again, I'm, I'm talking here about the Irish context, um, we were all told to stay home and stay safe. And for so many women, that home, their home was not a safe place. They were locked up, them and their children, with their perpetrator day and night. Uh, Women's Aid in Ireland reported a 43% increase during the first lockdown uh, of contacts with their service, of women who are really terrified for their safety and for their well-being and for that of their children. Um, just reflecting on my own work on the, on the sex trade in Ireland, I think uh, Kleena reflected, her, reflected earlier on, a, on a, the panel before about how this pandemic really brought into sharp relief what's going on for the most marginalised in our society. And what all of our research has shown in Ireland is that the women in the Irish tech trade are very vulnerable and marginalised. They're primarily migrant women, 94% of them in fact are migrant women. Many are undocumented, many don't speak good English, many are escaping poverty or other you know, very difficult situations in their country of origin. And we conducted a study during COVID to see how the situation was impacting on them. And what we discovered is that there was a significant increase in the violence that they were experiencing whilst in prostitution. 
Many of them took a break for a short time, but there, such was their need for finances that they felt they had no choice but to go back and see buyers in, per in person. So, you know, they were under a great deal of pressure and buyers knew that, and buyers were, um, I suppose, using their power, their, including their economic power over women to persuade them to do things that women wouldn't normally do. So we saw an increase in that case in, in sexual violence, in, in acts taking place without women's consent. And women were also under pressure where they were being controlled or coerced by pimps or traffickers. And then I suppose we see it on a wider global level as well, is that, you know, UNODC has been very clear that there has been an increase in trafficking during the pandemic. More women being groomed and coerced and drawn into the sex trade because they're in such dire circumstances financially, informal economies around the world have collapsed and women have no other recourse but to turn to prostitution. Um, and we also have seen, unfortunately, a real increase in the recruitment and grooming and coercion of women and girls into the sex trade online. So, you know, for me, this is another sh shadow pandemic is uh, going along underneath the pandemic is all these different forms of violence against women that are, you know, increasing in nature and abusers, perpetrators, pimps, traffickers finding new ways to tap into or draw on women's vulnerabilities and it's essentially, in the case of the sex trade, to draw them in and coerce them into that situation. Thanks, Ruth. And that you, you paint a, a very grim picture that I think draws on the same themes that Sharon and Deirdre have addressed about lack of power, that mm. it's those communities and, and, and those people who have least power in society who've been most severely impacted by COVID and uh, women tending to have less power than men at every level in, in society. So turning to you, Adrian, and thank you very much for joining us online. Uh, and I know you've worked with the World Health Organization. So perhaps if you could say something about the international picture, as Deirdre did, and tell us as well, you know, where, is, where, where can we learn good practice models? Where can we learn ways to address women's lack of power and to ensure that women, uh, women are, are that we are supported with empowerment strategies? So I think that's where we really need to look, is, you know, what are the strategies, what are the practical steps that we can take to ensure greater progress for women's empowerment? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, thank you for having me. Um, Nadine's shoes are certainly big to fill, so I'll do my best. Um, so, you know, groups like um, Women in Global Health are contributing significantly to advancing gender equality and empowering women. Um, they've grown exponentially in the last few years um, on, a, on a global scale. So there's 23 official chapters and supporters in 90 different countries, which really just indicates um, a thirst for change on a global level. And they're trying to make sure that decisions made about women uh, include women and not only in high income countries, but in low and middle income countries as well. So, you know, they've done things like uh, they've recently set up an official partnership with the WHO. Um, from a, a COVID standpoint, they developed the COVID 5050 task force. Um, that included five asks for global health security that the chapters could take to their own um, countries to work on. So that included things like equal representation, uh, safe and decent work, and gender responsive uh, approaches. Um, they've recently developed a PPE survey to assess uh, the availability, quality, and fit of PPE for women specifically. Um, you know, as Sharon mentioned, the vast majority of health workers and carers are women, um, and PPE is currently modeled to fit um, a 1950s American soldier. So um, they are trying to address things like that. And um, the US signed in their new gender policy, um, President Biden did, which incorporated a number of WGH asks, uh, which was a huge victory. So then building on that global momentum um, here in Ireland, uh, Paula and Bryn set up the WGH Ireland chapter in 2020, um, April. So we're fairly new still, um, but you know we're really trying to ensure that people leading the way on gender equality and women's empowerment in Ireland are the women working in that space. So again, as Sharon is saying, um, you know, as a nurse myself, this is um, the example closest to me, but over 70% of the health workforce are female and only 30% are leaders. And, you know, despite nursing being the largest occupation in the health sector, nurses are often left out of that global high level discourse um, and leadership positions are often filled by physicians. So, um, you know, we're trying to build 
sort of a shared movement where various disciplines and voices are represented. Um, and so what WGH Ireland has done is um, we've recently come up with our own strategy um, that highlights Irish and Irish affiliated women in global health, um, trying to support women in the workplace, gender transformative leadership, networking, um, systemic policy change, advocating for that in practical ways and connecting with the European chapter, um, as well as you know, groups like the International Council of Nurses, National Women's Council of Ireland, and then our host organization um, that Nadine um, represents is the Irish Global Health Network. So you know, we're always looking for people to come and join us. Um, and I think groups like WGH and then you know, by extension WGH Ireland are trying to um, operationalize some of the, the um, global, um, from, a, from a global perspective that WGH is, is doing with their asks, we're trying to operationalize that. Um, Adrian, so. thank you so much. I think you've illustrated for us the power of the collective, that women uh, mm -hmm. bring, you know, coming together in a network, as you've described, uh, can, can provide an, a way of redressing the power imbalance. Sharon, I might come back to you on, in terms of how you think that might help. I mean, you gave us some stark figures earlier from that IMO survey in ter um, about 18% of women in medicine experiencing harassment. And th those figures, of course, are not unique to medicine. I think we'd all be conscious of that. Some years ago with Trinity colleagues, we did a survey of women in law. We called it gender injustice. And we found uh, similar levels of discrimination and harassment being experienced by women, particularly in the solicitor's profession, where, uh, but also among barristers, where women were very much outnumbered in lots of areas, for instance, at the criminal bar uh, or in big firms, and where they were experiencing um, the sort of discriminations that I think you know, the IMO survey found among women in medicine. So how can we address this? Certainly, we set up a Women Lawyers Association, which I'm glad to say has... Has, is, is very much um, very much going strong today and perform, and does perform a hugely important role, particularly for junior women uh, coming into the solicitors and barristers professions. What can we say about medicine and about healthcare? Is the sort of collective networking um, a, a, a positive way forward? Is that the best way to try and address these really serious issues? Um, well, it is in that we can support each other. Um, but a lot of the time, when these things happen, they happen in clinical areas and on front line. Um, and it's more junior staff and staff that are newer in their career that are experiencing this as well. Um, part of me would like to see more senior staff spend more time in the front line. Um, even if that is a day a fortnight, a day a month, I think, you know, staff like myself and, and probably Adrienne as well, we have the battle scars um, <laughs> um, and we're long enough in the tooth that we know what's right and what's wrong. Um, and we're also confident enough in ourselves to be able to stand up and say, well, you can't say that to me or you can't do that or speak to me like that. And I think we would make good role models for more junior staff and for them to see, well, actually, this isn't appropriate. This isn't right. And this is how I deal with it. Um, what we tend to do in healthcare is when we promote staff, we promote them away from the front line. Um, and you'll find if you go onto the wards at the moment, most of the nurses that are on the wards are very young. Um, and it's, uh, they're young because it's a tough job. Um, and for, for nurses like myself, I'm not sure I could do it. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think I have the stamina. I know I, know I went back during COVID. You're but, still young. Uh, I, went, I spent a few weeks back on the wards during COVID and nearly killed me. Um, but, uh, but I think even for us to spend a certain amount of time coaching, uh, and mentoring junior staff and, and showing them that this is not acceptable and uh, uh, yeah, and bringing our experience to, to, to them, I think that's a, that's a good way to do it into the future. That's very interesting as a, an insight from the front line. And Deirdre, I might ask you just a, a different sort of uh, front line, but in the military, I mean, we've seen in recent weeks and uh, here in Ireland, obviously, the issue of sexual harassment in the military has really taken centre stage with the very brave individual women who've come forward and spoken about their experiences. And we're seeing a sea change, I think, as a result across the defence forces. Um, you know, again, what, what, are, what strategies can we adopt to ensure that this sort of 
dreadful discrimination and harassment doesn't occur in settings like military settings where women are so outnumbered. I'm conscious that Sharon's experience is in a setting, as you've said, where women are in fact a majority of frontline workers, albeit that among surgeons, a very small minority. But what about in the military? How do we address this issue? I think for the majority of my career, I worked in predominantly in all male um, environments and militaries by their very nature are traditionally male um, and traditionally will um, encourage kind of, you know, the traditional masculine stereotypes as well. So I think there has to be an understanding um, in, in all military organizations and we see similar, um, similar stories from uh, Australia, Canada, uh, the UK, um, around uh, bullying, harassment, sexual harassment. Um, and I think it's an understanding that, and kind of acknowledging that problems exist. Um, and this is taking place. And I think when you start off from that point, you can now go, okay, well, what can we do to address that? And what action plan can we put in place? Um, and understanding that military cultures, I think by their very nature, um, and the command structure, the hierarchical structure, don't in itself lend to you know, transparency, um, maybe accountability, maybe open, um, open discussion, um, and speaking truth to power. So you have to create within those structures and still maintaining the integrity of command structures because they are very important in a military setting, particularly when we're going to um, some of the most dangerous regions in the world where we're actively involved in, in combat and conflict. Um, maintaining the, that integrity, but building in mechanisms to be able to, to report, to follow up, um, to have transparent procedures. But most importantly, I think is the cultural piece um, you can have all the policies in the world, but unless you have a culture um, that encourages people to, to come forward, that encourages um, commanders and leaders at all levels to hold people accountable very, very visibly um, and uh, really be um, a survivor-centric, I think, approach to everything from investigations to reporting structures. Um, otherwise, if, if the cultural piece is off, nothing else is going to work. Uh, and we see that, we see that the world over um, in relation to organizations that have these fantastic policies that, and reporting processes that kind of sit in a shelf or they're on posters up on the wall. Um, but we really need a culture that, that supports people uh, through that. Um, and uh, we, 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 create, um, we create organizations really that, that pe put people front and center. Um, and I think that's with organizations, and uh, if we kind of come out of that more broadly, um, you know, there is a direct correlation between inequality, particularly gender inequality, and insecurity and conflict. So that conflict can be at a local level in, within organizations, within communities, within societies, and we can come out of that and see how that's actually driving um, international conflicts and regional conflicts uh, across the Sahel, for, for example. Um, so I think we, we do need to, a better understanding of, of that, um, d that direct kind of cause and effect of, of inequality um, and insecurity, um, and be prepared to take tangible, measurable, proactive actions uh, to address that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where, where I would come from, very much uh, at the, the action um, perspective. Um, we don't need any more policies. We don't need any more strategic reviews. We don't need any more commissions. We know what the issues are. They're in our societies. Inequality exists. So what are we going to do to address it? I love it. Yeah, no more policies. No, Just, we don't need them. <laughs> uh, but you're, I think it's interesting that you've identified culture and cultural change as the crucial point. And when I talked about the five C's we'd identified in politics, four of which are universal across different mm -hmm. careers, culture is the hardest, of course, to tackle. That we can, you know, we can set up uh, childcare systems in place to address that. We can instill greater confidence in young women. We can address the lack of cash through gender pay gap legislation and so on. But the cultural change is the crucial one, isn't it? Ruth, you might say something more about how we, how we take practical steps to address that culture, uh, to address embedded cultures that have, uh, that have enabled violence against women to persist for so long. So I couldn't agree more with Deirdre about it being culture, whether that's within organisations or more widely um, in different institutions in society. And I suppose, you know, from my perspective in terms of, you know, the work of SERP on, on something like the sex trade, you know, the sex trade is a highly gendered phenomenon. 95% um, of those who are selling sexual access are women. 
probably 99% who are using their, their purchase power to purchase sexual access to women or men. So it's extremely gendered. And I just think that we can never have a gender equal society when a trade like this exists. You know, that gives a message, not just to the women in prostitution, who, as I've said, tend to be very marginalized women in many ways and very vulnerable in many ways, but it gives a message to everyone in society that you know, women are sexual obje objects, that that's their primary purpose, that women's bodies are for sale, that sexual access can be bought to women and girls. And I think you know, that there's work to be done to kind of tackle and address that. And I think that seeps right through the sex trade into things like pornography. I mean, you know, the pornography that's available right now in our society, in our culture, that our children are being brought up on, is portraying extreme sexual violence. And it's normalizing that sexual violence and it's eroticizing it, really. So I think we've got a lot to do to address, I suppose, the proliferation of, of the sex trade in our society. I think um, we've got some work to do around consent and sexual consent in particular, and I think there is some good conversation starting around that. It's really positive to see the work of the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre and the universities, some of the universities around Ireland, who've decided to kind of take this issue and really run with it, and talk equally to young men and young women about what is the meaning of consent in these contexts. And I suppose I would extend that to ask, is sexual consent something that can be purchased? You know, is it true consent when you're having to hand money to somebody in order to gain sexual access to their body? Um, I think a few other practical things I can think of. I think safe spaces for women to disclose any kind of violence they're experiencing are really important. And I think healthcare settings are actually a very important place for that. Sometimes, particularly, I'm thinking of women who've been trafficked. That person might be the only person that, that is empathetic towards them enough for them to explain what's going on in their situation. Healthcare professionals have re been really important in the past and will continue to be in the future in terms of identifying women who are very marginalised and at risk in the sex trade or at risk of domestic or sexual violence in other contexts. Um, I think Deirdre and I were reflecting at the beginning just about, um, I suppose, the fact that it's nice in many ways to have an all-women panel. Um, but gender equality is about men and women, boys and girls, achieving equality together. So, you know, maybe it might be nice to see our man or two in this panel. So although, you know, I've spoken a lot about, um, you know, the harms of male violence here today and the impact that that has on women and girls, I think we've got some work to do to call on the good men. Because, of course, most men are not violent or, you know, sexually harassing women and girls, most men don't think it's a good idea to purchase sexual access to women and girls. So I think part of what we have to do is, is to call on those good men to stand up and speak out and really challenge that culture that, I suppose, perpetuates this, this idea that we can never be equal to each other. Thank you so much, Ruth. And that's a very good theme. I'm going to ask each of you just to address briefly in the last few minutes. And coming to you first, Adrian, you know, how do we harness the good men, the, the goodwill uh, among most people who do want to see, who do see men and women as equal and who are very much bought into the notion of gender equality. You know, how do we ensure that that, uh, that, that is, is the, uh, it, it, the, the, I suppose that goodwill is harnessed in a, in a positive and practical way, hearing what Deirdre has said about no more policies, but also about the need for cultural change. And I, you know, I suppose we haven't mentioned the Me Too movement, but clearly that has been, that's an undercurrent that has really helped so much to create greater awareness among both women and men about, you know, you know about, about what is going on about, uh, and about levels of sexual harassment. So I think that's been a very powerful uh, uh, movement as well. So Adrian, something, uh, perhaps a message about how we harness goodwill towards gender equality. Yeah, well, I, I definitely agree with no more policies. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, as, as you said, it's a collective responsibility. And so panels like this um, and events like this, where this topic is intentionally addressed, um, we sort of take a step forward um, in, in getting closer to that. Um, and I think, you know, of course, I'm biased towards groups like Women in Global Health, um, but um, most are, are volunteer-based. And so, you know, join one of these groups um, just to get a feel for what um, people are doing and what people in other countries are experiencing and kind of um, make sure that you have um, a global view of of some of these issues and I think that will go a long way to just making people sort of more empathetic and you know women and men um, as as they said so that would be my short. Thank, thanks Adrian. Sharon what do you think in terms of uh, 
moving, making progress here in the healthcare setting particularly? Um, well, I think we're, you know, we've made some progress in relation to gender mainstreaming. So when we speak about gender equality within health, it's both in relation to women's health and men's health. Um, and in a way, men's health is the, the poor relative in some cases of women's health. Um, and there is this, there's macho feelings as well of, uh, amongst men when it comes to looking after their own health and well-being. So it's, it's about getting the balance, really, I think. So it's not that there are, you know, good men and bad men. I think we just, from a healthcare perspective, everybody who has needs that need to be addressed, both whether physically, emotionally, psychologically, should have access to healthcare regardless of, of their gender. Deirdre, what about in a military setting where you, st where you do have these very embedded, very gendered cultures? Yeah, I think, I think it's, for me, it comes down to something really, really simple. I think when we look at, say, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how gender and gender equality cross-cuts every single one of those goals, we just need to bring it back to the home and to the local. And I think when we look at gender equality um, and barriers to that, you know, stereotyping, um, bias, if we bring it back to the home and we start looking at how to make our, our homes more gender equal, and I'll give you an example of that. I'm just off six months of maternity leave. My little girl is, is six months Congratulations. old. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it was a hard task to, to escape. Um, but uh, my, my husband now has taken the next six months out to, to raise her because it's not just about advocating. This isn't about being you know, a performative advocate for, for gender equality and, and calling out others or othering the issue. This starts in our home and being um, caregivers and parents to a young girl and her seeing dad um, taking care of the household duties, mum going out to work, um, being the, her main care provider and caregiver over the next um, six months. Um, and it wasn't easy for him to extract himself. He was hit with the same kind of um, biases and stereotyping um, that, well, that I expected him to be, uh, be hit with. You know, why are you doing that? Could, could Deirdre not take another six months out? Um, and then, you know, everything from what are you going to do with all your spare time um, that you have? And uh, he, he found it quite interesting because a lot of people brought out, well, this is going to negatively impact your career. Are you not worried about when you're sitting in front of a, an interview board or promotion board, how you're going to explain away that six months? And he found that process really interesting. And he's going to kind of detail that, that, those kind of um, reactions over the next six months. And even, you know, all the mother and baby groups that he's now joining uh, as the only dad, he's, he, he's getting to experience that. Um, but we're really proud to be setting that foundation uh, for, for our, our young baby. And I think we need to look at how we are socializing our young, our young people um, from the moment they exit the womb um, and how society and the media is socializing them and um, encouraging these, these traditional outdated stereotypes. Um, so for me, it starts very, very simple. Gender equality, it starts, it starts in the home, it starts then in our communities and from that our societies can grow and only then can we start looking at really achieving our, our sustainable development goals. You're absolutely right about it starting in the home and congratulations again uh, to you and to your partner as well. Ruth, what about you? What, what do you think in terms of well, the, the uh, local... Deirdre just reminded me of, it, it is a kind of, I think, old feminist adage that um, the personal is political. So I feel like this is a political act, what you and your partner have decided to do. And you're right, you know, it brings, the, you know, what your personal decision is also political because you're kind of being, the, you know, I'm full of cliches today, but you're being the change that you want to see. And I think that, you know, that's a lot of what it's about. We're modelling what we want to see for the next generation so that perhaps we can move towards that gender equality. And then I think the other thing is just, you know, it's relevant to all of us here today, and I think all of us have brought it up, is just, you know, having women at the table, women in leadership, so that they can model. And, you know, Ivana, you're for sure an example of that to many of us, that you're there, at, you know, making decisions that really matter, that really affect people, and, you know, that younger women can see that this is possible for women to do, and they can do it all and have a family, and etc. I mean, there's a lot of pressures on that on us to try and do it all, but I suppose, you know, it's right that we strive, and it's right that we, you know, make our our best efforts. Thank you. And I must say, I, I did an article on this years ago called Struggling with Juggling. And certainly I was pregnant with my second daughter when I was first elected. And it was almost unheard of at that point for somebody, for 
a, t a TD or a senator to be pregnant. And it's wonderful to see the cultural shift where we now have a pregnant Minister for Justice, who's, well, now a, a Minister for Justice on maternity leave. But that's the sort of cultural shift that we need to see. So it's so important. And